Clark Flower with Stephen Sales, locally here in the state of Utah where the Cooper power system is wrapped. This is my son Miles Flower. And uh, I'm glad to get to come and talk to you guys today about this switch because it, it's, uh, you have a number of Monk campuses we were just speaking about, the one over in the Digital Learning Center that is insulated with the SF6 gas, as well as this new version, which again is exactly the same components but insulated with a synthetic version of our FR3 fluid we call E200, which is a derivative of uh, soybean oil. And that's what exactly is what is in your transformer that we'll talk about later. Um, there are a couple of uh, specific manuals we'll leave today. The service manual on the switch itself, the S28510-1. Uh, which is in your electrical on and that has been put together for you. And in there it talks about the kind of things that you would do and see as you open up the switch. Um, about the only two things you're going to mess with or ever have to deal with are the connections. And typically in today's world, because of arc flash and whatnot, um, the infrared guns are a good way to keep an eye on those and you should on some regular basis annually or whatever your campus standard is be looking at those connections and make sure there's not any high heat elements in there um, and the other thing is the control and we have a separate uh, manual here the S285 75-1 which explains how to set the phase and ground trip settings on here so maybe we'll take just a break and open up the switch. This is a homemade one. Let's get a sled. Yeah, that's awesome. Sometimes the simple solutions are the best. So as you can see, inside the unit, as we were talking about the elbows, your larger T-body elbows, as they're known, are the dead brake 600 amp rated uh, elbows, and that's your loop for your feed coming in here. You're coming in one way and out the other way, or vice versa, depending on how your campus loop is set up. The smaller uh, bushings uh, and elbows are the 200 amp low brake bushings low brake because they can be unplugged with a hot stick. Standard procedures for safety reasons, again, arc flash protection, you're, you're only going to want to pull those in an emergency. Normally you'll schedule an outage even if you're going to pull your 200 amps off. The 600 amp dead brake is a bullet connection in that cover which also is hot stick removable. Again, after an outage has been taken and isolated upstream and downstream, because you're on a loop, you've got to do both. You would then unbolt that, and it's the same five-sided uh, pentahead wrench that unbolts that 600 amp elbow from the bushing. And that's kind of the only maintainable part. You can see your ground connections there. Everything's neatly wired and labeled and uh, easily visible. Again, for IR uh, heat uh, testing, you can take a look at those things. The two other things that you would take note of is the operating handles at the top. And the nice thing about the Cooper VFI, technically medium voltage switch gear is called a vacuum fall interrupter. For practical purposes, it's exactly the same function as a circuit breaker at the 480 volt level. It just has a different terminology according to IEEE and, and uh, the NEC. But it operates just like a molded case circuit breaker in that that handle when it's all the way up is closed and you can see the red semaphores in those little windows there which show you that these three ways are closed and the far uh, loop switch is currently open. There you have a little green indication on that. If you get a trip on these protected ways, VFI 1 or 2, that handle will pop halfway between the current closed position and the open position again just like a molded case circuit breaker would and after the fault has been cleared and discovered and corrected 
to close the unit back in, again, just like a mold decay circuit breaker, you pull the handle all the way down to the open position and you'll hear or feel a click or an arming of that device and then you can close it. It's a fail-safe deal. If you don't arm it all the way, if you don't turn it off and you try to close after a trip without having opened it and rearmed it mechanically, it won't stay in it just bounce back at you. And not vigorously, it just it'll just flop back out. So you can tell when you've rearmed them and when they go back up in, they really, and it takes quite a bit of force if you do that with a hot stick and, and that's the right way to do it. The other thing you'll notice is right in the middle of the unit there is a little oil side gauge and uh, that's the way you can check your liquid level. The fluid is very clear and so it's, it's easy to, to see what your oil levels are at. Um, and the parking stands, you can see the, the little U-shaped bracket and bushings there. And the contractor has provided for you some insulated standoff bushings, which are these six just to the left of the 200 amp elbows that allow you, if you're removing a 200 amp elbow, to park it on there after removing the dust cover. You never want to let a medium voltage connector at 200 or 600 amps flop around in the dirt or get dirty or dusty. It's, they're very sensitive to those things and that's how the corona and degradation gets started. So you want to keep everything very clean. That's why the uh, insulated standoff bushings, which you can see are all grounded. Very neat installation. The other thing that we would uh, talk about is the control. And maybe before we move to the controller, are there any questions about the hardware here? Okay, good. Again, because we've done this before with some of you, the, uh, the Digital Learning Center, it's exactly the same control as you have over there. And even though we have the bigger S2-85751 manual on how to set this up, this is really the instructions right here, and everything you need to know is on that little sticker as far as setting up your phase A, B, and C dip switches for the trip setting. And it explains that here on this little chart. And what you have is for each one that you turn on, which is in the down position just like it shows here, so we have the uh, 10 and 20 amps plus you add another 20 amps a default. The minimum setting is 20 amps on it. So we have the 30 with the 10 and the 20 plus the 20 default. So these are currently set at 50 amps. And I would imagine that trip setting came from the engineer. And so we're, we're all set and running. The same thing with the ground is, is also set at uh, 30 plus 10 for its default. So 40 amps on the ground and your um, instantaneous trip, there have been no values put in there, and that's for high current faults so that you don't go through the timing curve, which is an, an E curve. Um, the EF cards, these two cards here, this one's for the phase and this is for the ground, uh, timing of the curve, and those cards electronically simulate an E power fuse, a time current curve, okay? And so it allows for coordination of upstream and downstream devices knowing that. And that curve information is in your, your manual if you ever need to, down the road, uh, give that information to uh, somebody you're having to do a coordination study if you're doing one on your own also. And those are the only settings you have in there. So um, very simple device. Again, the one line diagram here on the door that explains in what order we have. And, and hopefully, as you're looking at that and seeing that the second source switch going to something downstream is open now, and that must be the way everybody wants it. But, uh, so we are live, right, Cameron? This yeah. is everything is hot on this side, and so the two going out to probably transformer loads um, are the T1 and the T2. Any questions? Very simple control, but yeah. one of the nice things about this control, because of the uh, type of integrated circuit it is and not a microprocessor, 
you don't need a, a CT or PT. You do have a CT, excuse me, but you don't need power inside. So even in a power failure, the control uh, is able to be tripped one time and you can manually reset it. So you don't need any external power. There's no PT inside to run the control. It just runs off of the uh, capacitive coupled uh, devices and the CTs. Perfect transformers. Okay. Again, any questions before we move to the transformer outside? Got to get yourself one of those real fancy tools. <laughs> We've now moved outside to the transformer yard. We have two oil-filled uh, transformers here. The high voltage section here, where you have your 12470 coming in, is the same kind of elbows we saw on the switch here inside the uh, uh, switch room next door. The low voltage section, as you can see out here, has um, your bus supports for your, your cable. Again, everything looks extremely neat and tidy inside there. This low voltage section is where you'll all find the gauges. You may all want to come over here and take a look. You'll see a temperature and a pressure gauge and a liquid level gauge. So you've got three gauges in there. There's a little indicator of where we should be, um, pressure and what your high temperature has been. Can reset that, and that probably would be a good thing to do in your annual PM is to reset that little red temperature arm so you can know what your max temperature is each year. One of the great things about a liquid filled transformer is their cooling capability and their ability to handle overloads uh, makes them extremely durable, as you're probably all aware. A dry type transformer, if you overload it for 10% or buy 10% for 10 minutes, it's probably going to be toast. Cool. Yeah. In a liquid filled transformer, especially the ones filled with the vegetable oil dielectric, if you do that 10% for 10 minutes, you won't even see that. It'll still last you 80 years. And I, I mean 80 years. It used to be liquid filled transformers with mineral oil would last typically 30, 40, 50 years. With the FR3, because of the ability to pull moisture out of the craft paper, which is the weak link in any transformer, dry or oil paper tensile strength uh, lasts five to eight times longer. So you got some, some great things. The fluid, because it's a vegetable oil and it's actually an edible FDA listed product, if there is a spill, you don't have an EPA problem. You may have a mess and some pants. And that's, if you do have a leak someday, that's probably how you recognize it is you see pants. bugs yeah, coming after it, eating them. So you want to clean that up and let us know about any problems there. We have a couple of manuals uh, on our transformers that are also in your electrical O&M and it, even more so than the switch, kind of the only thing you can do here is check your connections, both your elbow and your low voltage with your uh, heat testing the IR gun uh, on a regular basis, whatever your established is here, we recommend at least annually. And the other thing is to draw an oil sample. There are testing agencies in the state and elsewhere that um, are readily findable. If you need some names, we'd be happy to give those to you. Uh, I know Taylor Electric knows some of those testing agencies as well. And pulling a, a vial of the oil and having it put through a dissolved gas analysis at one of the testing labs will tell you its dielectric strength, the H2O water content, um, acetylene gas levels which would indicate arcing between you know low brake switch or a tap or something like that in there which is bad you want to know if those things are going on and the carbon levels indicate if there's any degradation in the insulating craft paper there's a few other uh, benchmark items on there but any testing lab that does the DGA analysis will give you a complete written report on those things and it's really pretty inexpensive to pull that oil sample out of the drain valve in the bottom here. Um, most universities that we deal with do that on a five-year rotating basis. That is, they'll take about 20% of their campus each year and do an oil sample so that every five years you come back to the same transformer. And especially if you have two or more samples from a transformer over a period of time, you get a very good load um, uh, profile and trending if there's something going on inside there. 
The only other time you might want to pull an extra DGA test on a transformer is if there's been a significant event like a lightning strike on the building or in the transformer yard or something that causes the VFI or your low voltage switch gear to take the whole building down. Um, if there's some catastrophic event like that, it would be good to test your transformers immediately following that and compare them with the prior tests. That's about, because there's no moving parts in a transformer, that's uh, about all we can tell you about that. Any questions that you would have? Where did they get the oil from? Is it that valve? Yes, there's a drain valve down on the bottom here. Just looks like your hose spigot. Uh, you, you don't want to put that in some container and take it to the lab. You want to get the lab to bring you the uh, clean vials that they have for you. You've done this before. Yeah, so. we're not going to be. Yeah, we're not going to be. Or you'll hire a, an outside yeah. contractor to do yeah. it. Sure. But that's that's the drain and sampling valve they call it. Yeah. yeah. So. There's no questions. I think that's that covers everything on our agenda. What's the warranty on this sheet on these? Uh, warranty on the transformers themselves, one year after energization.